These people are victims of ethnic cleansing. Yes, that's right. These people are stuck in a humanitarian catastrophe. But there's also more to them than their victimhood. Imagine this. Your village was attacked by a lynch mob. All your houses were burned down. Many people were slaughtered. All because of some ethnic divide. Now you and tens, hundreds of thousands of survivors are driven into camps and you can't leave. You try to shield the children from the hopelessness, but you see no future. And also imagine there's a photographer around taking what may be the last pictures of you and your family. Take a little moment to think about it. What sort of pictures would you wish for? These images are very different from those I had expected to bring back from a catastrophe, but these faces invited me to portray them, and I responded, because there's something deeply engaging about the human face and the human gaze. When you look at a picture, a photograph, something very powerful happens if the person in the picture is looking right back at you. If, as they say, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Not only are you looking into another person's soul, but through the magic of eye contact, your souls can connect. You can recognize that you are both of the same kind. I was there with a relief organization documenting the truly fantastic work they did, drilling wells and providing medical services. That was my assignment and I had mental images of what such documentation should look like. But the severity of the human catastrophe going on and me being the only photographer there compelled me to try to document the disaster itself. Now, the shocking pictures that we often see from catastrophes are also the kind of pictures that we may grow numb to. They must outbid each other in graphic tragedy to achieve emotional impact. They can be timely wake-up calls, but they can also separate us by widening the imaginary separation between them, the victims, and us. We risk becoming two separate kinds. As I walked around the camps with my cameras, people kept posing as if for family albums, trying to look their best, putting on brave smiles. And as I was trying to be the disaster photojournalist, I was constantly surrounded by crowds of noisy, laughing, smiling children. Life in a refugee camp isn't much fun. So we tried to provide some entertainment, some comic relief, like trying to see how many we could fit on one bicycle. <laughs> and we taught them 
the magic trick, do you know this? How to bite off one's thumb, like this. And we had half a refugee camp doing that simultaneously, <laughs> or failing to do that. And they laughed and they laughed as if they hadn't laughed in a very, very long time. So, my memory cards were filling up with pictures, not only of the human suffering all around me, but posing people, showing strength and humanity and friendliness, resilience. We're in a refugee tent. A relief worker is conducting interviews with an elderly couple and their grandchildren. The middle generation is missing. They're dead. And as grandpa and grandma are describing how the children's parents got killed, my attention shifts towards the children's faces. They're sitting there silently, listening to the horror, struggling to hold back their tears. So. I start to take their portraits, trying to capture some of their silent strength and dignity. It gets unbearable for everyone, and when the basic facts are recorded, no one can stand it anymore. And as we're getting up to leave, a woman who'd been silent all along stops us and she asks very shyly, almost whispers, my child was also killed during the same events. Could you please register the death of my child too? And that became a bit of a turning point for me. No one wants to vanish without a trace. One young man told me, very plainly, he said, there's no hope for us, but please take our photographs so that it can be remembered that we once existed. And I want my photos to uphold the memory of this little girl. Her name is Teslima. She was four months old, and her mother hadn't had anything to eat in a long time, so she'd lost her milk. And little Teslima was fading away. And gradually, I started to understand why they were posing like that for the camera. They weren't just victims or refugees. And I accepted that these were the kinds of photos they wanted me to take. Smiling and proud, alive. This guy's shirt says, don't worry, be happy. These people are the Rohingya minority in Burma. Burmese authorities don't recognize that they even exist, and they're basically stateless. This situation remains unchanged, but I had been there in the Rakhine province of Burma also two years previously, and then the majority population had struck me as some of the kindest and gentlest people I had ever met. Yet now, they were engaging in ethnic cleansing of these people, their neighbors. There's no way I can explain or even begin to understand that. But somehow, this ethnic group must have ceased to be fully human in the eyes of the majority. In the build-up towards 
the violent explosion of ethnic violence across the province, agitators for ethnic purity had described the Rohingyas as so ugly they don't even look human. While rhetoric can be dehumanizing, portrait photography can be rehumanizing. I believe in the power of eye contact. We're born with software for facial recognition and our ability to interpret faces is very powerful. Our brains are hardwired and fine-tuned, especially for that very task. Photographic portraits may function as a kind of mirrors in the sense that they allow us to identify with otherwise anonymous strangers. The very first step towards avoiding such terrible tragedies is to be able to look into the eyes of a stranger and see ourselves, to recognize that they are in fact us. Our humanity depends on that.